Sunday school teacher who was teaching the kindergarten class uh, decided that she was going to give him a little test one morning, and uh, an unusual little test. So she said uh, to her class, she says, can I go to heaven by coming to church every Sunday? And the class said, no ma'am, no. She said, well, uh, can I get to heaven if I uh, give a big offering every Sunday? No ma'am, can't do that. She said, well, how about if I vacuum the church and clean it up? Can I, can I go, to, go, to, go to heaven if I do all of that? No, they knew. Can't go. So she says, well, well how can I get to heaven? And it was kind of quiet there for a few minutes. Nobody had anything to say. And finally, a little boy in the back of the room jumped up and says, well, ma'am, first you have to die. title of the message this morning is The Plot. The Plot. We'll be looking at uh, John 11, and I've got the wrong numbers here. It's 45 through 57. And, uh, but first, we want to look at the setting, where it takes place. It takes place outside of Bethany at Lazarus's tomb four days, four days after he was dead. And Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And of course, uh, when he went there to the tomb, he told him to, uh, to remove the stone. And Martha said, oh, but Lord, don't do that. That's going to be a terrible stinking odor. Have you ever driven down the highway and you've seen some of those dead uh, armadillos or uh, dead raccoons who have, uh, that rigor mortis has set in and suddenly their bellies have popped? And the smell is awful, even when you've got your windshields up. I mean, your wind, uh, uh, well, we'll get it right. Your window's up, and uh, it, it's an awful smell. So can you imagine the kind of smell that would have been there at this time? And you know, the thing is, is Jesus deliberately delayed. Now, he could not have made it back before uh, Lazarus died, but he delayed a couple more days so that it would be what? It'd be four days. Why? Because he told him want you to see the glory of God. Not only can, can God raise somebody up, but he can raise somebody up that's already started to rot and already has an odor about him. Now, we shouldn't think it'd be too hard because Jesus, after all, he took that man who had a, an arm that was all shriveled up and he made it whole again. So it's no problem for Jesus to, to make this man whole, even though he's rotted. So it was a fantastic, extraordinary, awesome, unique miracle. He says, Lazarus, come out. And he came out, all bound up. And of course, everyone was standing around looking at him. And I could picture someone today would look at him and say, well, don't just stand there looking. Do something. I'm, you need to untie him. You need to let him loose. Let him loose. And of course, they did. Now, the thing is, all of the people who were there at Mary and Martha's house had filtered out now and come to the grave. And we don't know how many people there, but it seems like it was a fairly good crowd that was there at this time. And it was these people, the friends and the neighbors and the families and the mourners, they were all there. So we've got a crowd. Now the question is, though, what effect does this miracle have on the people who are gathered there and on the whole Jewish nation? And of course, on us today, we, we always have to understand that. So let's read. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin or Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they ask? Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. 
You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own. Underscore this. But as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God. To bring them together. To make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdraw to, withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country of Jerusalem, uh, Ju to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so they might arrest him. So as we see, the result of the crowd was there's a split decision here. My father, he was, uh, he was a, a, an amateur boxer in his young days. And uh, about the time that I was born... <laughs> Uh, night, I'm not going to tell you when that was, but it's in the 40s anyway. But uh, about the time I was born, he was the Southeast United States uh, middleweight champion in the Golden Gloves. And he went to uh, Madison Square Garden and he lost in the semifinals there. But, uh, but nevertheless, in the 1950s, the Friday night fights used to come on the air. And my daddy loved to watch him. And not only did he love to watch him, he loved me to be right there with him to watch him. So I watched a lot of fights in the 50s. And uh, the bouts, the bouts uh, that, that happened ended in either a, a knockout or a technical knockout or a decision or what they called a split decision. Now, what it was was you had two judges and the referee. Each one had a vote. And a split decision meant that Two of them voted one way, and one of them voted the other. They were rare, but they were okay. They happened. That's what happened here with Jesus. We've got a split decision. What's going on? Many believed in Jesus, but some went to the Pharisees to report to them immediately. Immediately. Now, <coughs> there. Right about that time, the Pharisees, they pushed the panic button. And along with the chief priests, they called a special meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin would be compared to our Supreme Court, except they never overturned the decision of a lower court. And basically, they dealt mostly with religious as well as secular uh, crimes. Because you understand that in Judaism, there was no separation, really, between the sacred and the secular. And, and so they, they ruled over them. And these people, there were 71 of them in the Sanhedrin. One of them was the high priest. And the others were made up of the two ruling parties, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Uh, the Sadducees were the priests and the chief priests and the high priest. They took care of the temple. The Pharisees were the teachers of the law and the rulers and leaders of the synagogues. And that's where they took care of things. Now the leader or ruler of the Sanhedrin was the high priest. And in 30 A.D., right about the time that Jesus was being tried, the Romans took away the power of the Sanhedrin to put anyone to death. They no longer had the privilege of the death sentence. Then, after that, only Roman high officials, such as procurators, governors, proconsuls, and Caesar himself, could put a man to death. 
Now the Sanhedrin met most days of the week except on Saturdays and the great feast days. But this one, again, is a special meeting with a special purpose, a special topic. And the topic is Jesus. The topic is Jesus. Because you see, things have really gotten out of hand. All of their attempts to silence him and turn the people against him had failed. And now he did this great miracle with all of these witnesses. You see, they had accused him of law-breaking, especially breaking the Sabbath laws. But of course, Jesus used Scripture to justify himself. They bombarded him with false accusations. What you do is by the power of Satan. Oh, you're a Samaritan. You're leading a rebellion. And they tried to trap him also with the law and with all kinds of trick questions. <clears throat> they tried to make him look bad to the people. But their plots always backfired and they walked away frustrated. Even, even after they had denied entrance into the synagogues of anyone who followed Jesus or went around listening to Jesus. They wouldn't let him in the synagogues, but that had very little effect either. So, indeed, they were frustrated. And not only were they frustrated, but they were afraid. Afraid. He kept doing miracles. And if he keeps on doing them, all these people are going to believe. And that's what they're afraid of. They'll believe in him. And there's another underlying freedom, not only a fear, not only the idea that uh, Jesus could, could be believed by all the people, or at least most of the people, but that the Roman government, the Roman soldiers, if this keeps up, you see, all they could see is that Jesus would cause them problems by some kind of rebellion or trying to lead other people astray. Because after all, he had said he's a king, king, but his kingdom was different, but they couldn't understand that. But the point was is that they were afraid. They were afraid that the Romans would come and do what? Would both take away their place and their nation. Well, what do you mean by their place? Their position. Their position as members of the Sanhedrin. Their positions as leaders of the Jews. Their position as members of that Supreme Court. They'd take it away. And not only that, but they could destroy the nation. And at this point, they had said all they could say. They battered it back and forth with one another. And then Caiaphas, the high priest, spoke. But he prophesied. And it is a prophecy. Prophecy comes from where? From God. He was high priest. And whether or not he was a good man, bad man, or anything else, he was high priest. And God revealed through the high priest different things. And so God is revealing here. It is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. And John testified that we, these were not the works, words of men, but the words of God when he said, He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Now these men thought it was all their idea. But you see, it really wasn't. This was God's plan. And it went far beyond what the high priest said. John said, and not only for the nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. He's not talking about all the just Jews. This is another one of those prophecies. And he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, all the people of God, that indeed through Jesus Christ they're going to be brought together into the church, into the kingdom of God. 
And that's what he's talking about. He's not call, talking about calling the Jews back to Judea. He's not talking about reaching out to the diaspora. That's what he's talking about. It was a picture of reaching those Gentiles as well, bringing them all together into the church. In their plotting, though it never occurred to them that they were putting to death the Son of God, they thought they were saving their nation. But you know what? In 40 years, mind you, 40 years, this is 30 A.D., 40 years in 70 A.D., their fears were realized. The Romans would destroy all of Jerusalem and the temple would be demolished, completely demolished. Now the result of this particular special meeting was the decision, let's kill Jesus. Let's kill him. However, timing wasn't right at this time. So Jesus took sanctuary in Ephraim near the desert. Now not a sand desert like the Sahara, but a place where there's not very many people and there's very little vegetation, if any. And he went there to wait for the right time, for God's timing. And it was always God's timing and never the timing of men. God had planned this before the creation of the universe. And he was bringing out his plan. God used hateful men to do his will. The time came. It was Passover. And as Passover approached, many came to Jerusalem. And they came earlier. Why? Because they needed to go through a purification uh, time, uh, washing themselves with water. And they needed to do that at the temple area. And so they came, and they came earlier. And they had to do that in order to eat the Passover. And so they did. And then it says, they kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, what do you think? What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? You see, there's a lot of anticipation. And those in the know were waiting to see what would happen. Because the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. Now as what happens with so many diabolical plots and devilish plans, this plot would have to take place in secret. Because you see, they dared not arrest Jesus there in the middle of Jerusalem during the middle of the feast because they knew that if they did, there was a possibility of a riot. And they knew that if the riot came, the Romans would lose force uh, to destroy half of them if they wanted to. But they would put down that riot and they'd kill a lot of people in the process. That was the way the Romans were. They always used deadly force. Now this passage was the prelude to Jesus' arrest, his trials, his convictions, his scourging, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. So let's get down to the gist of the matter. What do we need to take away from this? This passage, again, is not just about the arrogance, stubbornness, meanness, and foolishness of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. It's the picture of all humanity. It's the picture of all humanity. It's all of us. It's all the meanness that we store up in our hearts and our minds and all the meanness that we do.
picture of all of us, and especially more, maybe so, in, in this modern world of ours, maybe more than ever before. Because you see, this, this is a picture of men who think what? That they know what is best for them and for their nation. So much so that they were willing to kill a man, the very Son of God. Why? Because they thought that it was the right thing to do. Today, everyone, everyone thinks he knows what's right. It's my body. I have the right to do with it as I please. It's my life. Don't you dare tell me what to do. I'm the only one that knows what's right for me. Everyone has become their own God. And they know more than anyone else. They know more than our leaders. They know more than our teachers. They know more than our preachers. They know more than our Bible. And they know more than God does. Listen. There's something at work here. Greater than what we think or do. Just as there was something at work that was greater than the plans of the Sanhedrin. And John clearly points out in this passage that God's plans superseded and surpassed the plans of those wicked men. God had decided again before the creation of the world that Jesus would die for our sins. God was just using them and their wickedness to fulfill his plan. Remember when Jesus prayed, if there's any other way? There wasn't another way. So God, let his son be crucified. Also, God was interested in more than just saving the physical nation of Judea. He was interested in saving mankind from spiritual destruction. That's what's at work here. God wants to save us from spiritual destruction. And he wants us to repent of our sins. And he wants us to change, to really change. So that we really love him and we really love our neighbors. We really care about people and not just ourselves. That we forget all of our selfishness and self-centeredness. You know, it's an interesting thing. All may not have been lost even for those members of that Sanhedrin. Now we don't know because it doesn't tell us if any of them later repented. But you know what it does tell us in scriptures? In different places, it says that many of the Pharisees became believers. And it says in another place, many of the priests became believers. Who knows? Some of them. We already know that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were believers. But more of them may have. You know, Jesus offers every one of us forgiveness. Forgiveness for, for what? For every little mean, hateful thing we have ever done. Even when we calculated it and plotted it and intentionally did it. Even when it wasn't an accident that we just felt mean that day. Most of you have kids. What happens every once in a while with those kids when they get up in the morning or when they don't get a nap? It's a mean day. It's a mean day. And sometimes it's a mean day for us. But you know what? God loves us. And he forgives us when we repent. And he wants us to change. 
and he wants us to live for him. You know, that's a message for our world. It's a message for, for everyone, especially those who always think that they're right. Only God's right. And God is so full of grace. So full of grace. That when we trust in him. And in his righteousness. Which where it comes from where? It comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from faith in him. It comes from that time that indeed we accept Christ. And we're put under that water. And rise up in a newness of life. Yeah. When we repent and are baptized, washing away our sin. So that brings us to the point this morning. How much does God love us? God loves us enough to let wicked, evil men put to death his son so that we might have forgiveness and eternal life. So the question is, if you're outside of Christ and haven't accepted him yet, don't you want to? Don't you want to repent? Don't you want to repent and be baptized and have your sins washed away? To come to him in a newness of life? To let him make you righteous and holy? And don't you want to live for him and start loving him and loving one another? The kind way instead of the mean way? Choice is yours. We're going to have an invitation this morning. And Philip's going to come and lead us. You need to make the choice. Invitation song number 385, 385, I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's all stand. We'll sing first and last verse, one and four. <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning We'll close this morning with saying first verse 542. 542, Savior like a shepherd lead us. Savior like a shepherd lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy foes prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast taught us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast taught us thine we are. Have a good evening.